All right, welcome in. Uh, I am John Kurtz. Typically, you see me with Aaron Lockett. That is not the case today. We have an emergency, emergency K-State basketball podcast because after a decade in Manhattan, Bruce Weber is out as the head coach at K-State. He officially resigned his position. That's the way it was positioned in the press release by K-State, but that came down today. Obviously, this is layered, 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 layered. Everything going on here. Where does K-State go next? What is the legacy of Bruce Weber? Should this have happened right now? There are a lot of avenues to go down, and I'm sure everybody uh, really wants to hear what we have to say. So I am John Kurtz. Derek Young, you know him from K-State Online. Cole Manbeck, you know him from Power Cat Game Day, for Manhattan Mercury, beat writer for K-State. Uh, very good resource on the Cats as well. We all happen to be very good friends, and so I'm very much looking forward to this conversation because we've been doing this basically over text uh, in a group chat over the last 24 to 48 hours as this was all coming to a head. And now here we are getting a chance to break it down and discuss it. So shout out to 360 Vodka, Holiday Distillery. Those guys have been awesome in supporting everything that we do here on KCSN uh, and very much appreciate them helping bring this to you once again. But let's just start with this initial reactions. Like I don't think any, none of us were surprised. I think we all had an idea that this was coming and that goes for even just your general fan had a pretty good idea that this was where it was headed. Bruce Weber finishing ninth or 10th in the league for a third straight year, bottomed out at the end of the season. Um, it was pretty obvious that this was going to happen. Us being insiders, right? We had more of a heads up that this was going to happen. But still, I don't know, VY, like to me, still, there's this part of you that's like, this is weird. Like, this is weird to see it happen and actually in print. I was just looking down at my phone and saw like the headline from the email that I got from K-State still, like Bruce Weber resigns as men's basketball coach at K-State. It had been so long, a decade, and so many ups and downs and so much infighting with the fans. Like, it is very crazy to be here, like, actually at the moment where this has happened and, and Bruce Weber is no longer the coach at K-State. Yeah, 10 years, but it probably felt longer for many because of a, a lot of the ups and downs and inconsistencies and just all the stuff that uh, – and adversity that everyone went through, there was a – a bit of a roller coaster ride with Bruce Weber, probably much like his career has been. It is going to be weird to see someone else roaming the sidelines just because of how different it'll feel and how everyone was accustomed to seeing Bruce Weber on the sideline. But I will say that the most surprising development from all of it thus far, and, and I'm sure this is probably agreed upon by just about everyone, it's just a matter that Bruce Weber is going out. He's always been kind of, you know, he is open-minded and kind of free-spirited when he, when he speaks with the media, but he typically still is much more reserved than he's been in the last 24, 48 hours. It's probably because reality is setting in in many ways, but I'm just surprised that, I mean, he's taking shots at Kansas. Um, even if a little bit failed, he's, you know, taking shots at the fans a little bit because of how he realizes that he probably didn't receive some of the credit he deserves for some of the highs that they – experience so in ways kind of going out in a blaze of glory which is not something that's typically up his alley i think i think that's that's the perfect way to describe it right cool a blaze of glory that we've seen from bruce weber not only in his like six minute salvo that he had actually at the podium in kansas city after losing to west virginia but also then in the follow-up press conference which we can get into that i'm not crazy about k-state giving a platform and a live mic to somebody that they they just, in essence, fired. Um, you're typically going to get a lot of raw emotions and, and kind of put yourself in harm's way there. But I don't know. It's a huge deal in the end. But, I, I mean, there is there is a part of me that just I, I can respect the fact that Bruce Weber is airing out some of these grievances, I suppose, on the way out the door. Uh, last night's six-minute speech that he gave should have been the last time he spoke as a representative of Kansas State. He should not have been given a platform today. He should not have been given the opportunity to speak. It's PR 101. You don't allow a coach that's fired to have a press conference right after that. I mean, I think we know what happened with Ron Prince. K-State did that as well, where they had a press conference with Ron Prince right after he was fired. And it's just something you don't do. Uh, you know, it's a mistake. And I was not surprised that Bruce Weber did this. Uh, Bruce Weber has always struck me as someone that's very insecure with things that he's accomplished in his career. And you could hear it last night when he gave his six minute speech, when he rattled off, you know, reminded everybody while he degraded the K-State program that they hadn't won a conference title in 30 plus years and rattled off every coach's name and went through all of that. I mean, it was very cringeworthy to me. I mean, I, I, I was offended by it. I mean, I, I, it, it 
ticked me off, to be honest. And, and that's just what he does. I mean, he's just he's not great at PR. I've gone to I've come to ignore it um, to a sense, a sense. But you know, today he's taking shots at K State's fan base on social media. The toxic atmosphere. Look, social media is toxic in general. It's not just K State fans. But the bigger concern to me is I wonder if Bruce Weber truly thinks that he failed these last three years, if, it, if he really thinks it was on him. I've always wondered how accountable he is by the way he talks. There's always an excuse, and that's really why Kansas State fans could never buy into him because of the way he spoke at these press conferences, the things he said. There was always an excuse tied to everything. And I think he would have been a lot more accepted if you go from Frank Martin to him if he just – excuse time and talk about how it's oh so sad we just got break etc I think he would have been a more accepted coach here look I'm not saying state fans universally would have accepted him because it, it's quite the contrast from Frank Martin to him but it just really felt like a fit and you know it, it's unfortunate I, I could see why he's a little insecure because K-State fans never truly universally accepted him but uh, it, it's definitely time to move on and and I think hopefully K-State can get a guy that unifies the whole fan base so they're not split any longer. And, you know, they start coming to games and groves again. Well, I, I think I may know a guy. <laughs> um, but, I mean, on that hmm. subject, look, that, that is kind of like a, a, a two-way street. So I hear what you're saying, and I, I pulled up your uh, Kellis Robinette's tweet who was uh, at the press conference for, for Bruce where he said this. It says, Bruce Weber says the negativity surrounding K-State sports at times is disappointing. It got to a point where he didn't want his players on social media. He hopes that changes with a new coach. Challenges fans to Phil Bramlage again. There was also a part of that where he said it was the most difficult. It was the only stop in his career where he had to worry about players getting on social media. That's the part that bothers me where it's like, okay, look, you've been at K-State since 2012. Um, Twitter was just kind of coming into its, its form that it's in now at that point in time. People at Illinois, like Illinois fans hated Bruce. Hated Bruce went through kind of the same exact thing that the K-State fans did. If Twitter were in its heyday when he was at Illinois, it would have been the, the exact same thing. So that's the only part of it that I really take a ton of issue with. In general, like, man, I get it. He's never been good presenting himself publicly. Uh, that has been it. You're right. It's a huge part of why K-State fans never bought into him. But I would also be pretty resentful if I were Bruce at this point in time because of the climate surrounding his entrance. Like there was such an aura of vitriol toward him. That was not even his fault. It was, it, someone asked me on Twitter, like, Hey, who did you want hired? Like, cause I admitted, I, I hated the Bruce hire when it happened. And someone said, well, who did you want hired? I was like, well, it wasn't about the hire. It was about the fact that I hated John Curry, the athletic director, obviously at the time for making Frank's situation so untenable that Frank Martin left. And he had so much hatred and anger because there was such an attachment to Frank, the first guy to bring winning basketball to K-State in our lifetimes, like those of our generation, the first time we had ever seen it. And this athletic director just came in and basically ran him off because he wanted someone more clean cut, um, didn't like the yelling and screaming, the personality. And so you, you were going to hate basically whoever it was next. And then it was what I think a lot of us consider to be a fairly uninspiring hire at the time. And so Bruce, is, since day one, has just had haters, haters, haters. No matter what he's accomplished, I think a lot of us, I certainly didn't enjoy the first Big 12 championship as much as I should have that first year because I was too busy rooting for my prediction to be right and just rooted in the vitriol that I had for the whole situation. So in fairness to Bruce, I will say, like, if you've dealt with that for a decade, like, we think it's exhausting as fans. I'm sure it's incredibly exhausting as a coach to also deal with that. And so now when the emotions are raw and you do have a microphone in front of you, like I, I, I will cut him some slack in, in that respect, at least. I would agree. I think th like you, John, the only bone I really picked and, and it's probably being a little bit kind to Bruce Weber, just because he did rattle off a few things that probably made fans cringe, you know, multiple times, but was the fact that he almost singled out Kansas state as the lone, you know, criminal in terms of the toxicity that happens in social media or within a fan base. And clearly that's something that's a problem for multiple fan bases or nearly every fan base, probably every fan base. If you look hard enough, uh, you know, I, I retweeted something, you know, uh, recently from a Wichita state player. They got knocked out in the AAC tournament. It was Dexter Dennis, which I think it was the league's defensive player of the year. 
and his direct messages are just full of fans just, you know, giving him the, you know, the what for and insult after insult. So I think, you know, regardless of who you root for, you're going to have bad apples in every fan base. So I think the, the part that I took the most exception with was singling out Kansas State as if they were, I guess, exclusive or a little bit more special of a problem. And, and I know that some of it was probably due to being triggered by some of the fan the signs that were in the crowd too, saying bye-bye Bruce and, and stuff of that nature right across from the bench as well. So I understand the resentment, but they're probably taking it more personally than they should. Cole, I'll give you the floor for a, for a rebuttal to that before we move off of it, if you'd like. No, I mean, look, I get it. it it's, it's emotional to me. Like I get tied in, I, you know, with everything that's transpired, I think, you know, we talk about the PR stuff, but I, I think a lot of it, the best seasons were, you know, followed up with first round losses in the NCAA tournament. And I think Bruce Weber could have done himself a lot of favors if they just won their first round game, even when they were a four seed in the turn and got into that second round. But instead, you know, they lose to LaSalle, their own backyard with a K-State fan base, you know, packing Sprint Center. And then they lose against UC Irvine. And, you know, he benches Barry Brown essentially the entire first half with two fouls, which was a very frustrating thing. And like, I, I think if Bruce Weber made another Sweet 16 run in one of those two years, I think the criticism would have lessened a little bit, the blowback that he received, and you know, for everything that he did. But unfortunately, they they fell out of the tournament both those times. So it, it kind of hurts the Elite Eight run because that's the only year that they really advance in the NCAA tournament. And so... I, I think that certainly hurt him. He's just, he's a very pol polarizing figure as a result of that. I mean, look, Kellis framed it up well today on Twitter of the Kansas City Star when he did say if the next coach gave K-State what Bruce Weber gave in his first seven years, you know, K-State fans would take that in a heartbeat. And as I look back on that and reflect, I would. I mean, I, I would take and appreciate two Big 12 titles in seven years and a lead eight run. Um, you know, in a couple losing seasons. I would take that in a heartbeat, whoever the next coach is. So I probably was not as appreciative and didn't enjoy it as much as I should have during that time. I will say the Dean Wade, Barry Brown year, when they won the Big 12, I enjoyed the heck out of that year. Um, I had a lot of fun, and it, it just sucked that they lost that early in the NCAA tournament, left a kind of sickening feeling in my stomach. You, know, you, you want to watch your team advance in March. And yeah, you and I were at the game you know, last night, John, and we were just, we felt nothing as we watched that game. I mean, we talked about it. There was just, there was no emotion. The apathy had set in. I mean, we've been apathetic for a couple of years now, and that's what we have to get rid of. I mean, to me, that's the biggest concern. Whenever you start to see a program, the fan base feel apathetic is when things have really taken a turn for the worse. I mean, I, I felt like I cared more during the Wolders years than this last year until they started to play good basketball down the stretch until this last six game losing streak. So you know, it, it's a tough thing. I, Bruce Weber, obviously very polarizing. Appreciate him for what he did, but, you know, certainly did not like the way that he went out today with the the presser and, and talking about, you know, it, it just comes across as insecure and talking down about the K-State program. I just wish he'd take his accomplishments and not feel the need to remind everybody all the time about him. I, I think he feels the need to remind everyone because, he feels like he didn't get the credit he deserves. And maybe that makes him insecure. I don't know, because some of that I think is understandable. I will say two seasons I think are problematic for Bruce Weber. The year after they won the Big 12 should not have been as much of a downturn as it was. They finished last in the Big 12 and they had the Cartier job basket fiasco. So that, that was a problematic season. And then this one, because obviously he needed to respond and, and make up for the past two detrimental seasons and instead they go six and 12 and miss the NCAA tournament for a third straight year. You know what? Uh, I'll throw something else in DY. You, you know, what didn't help him. You know, what didn't help him either is, you know, Frank Martin goes on a final four run at South Carolina, which I know that yep. he hasn't made a tournament since, but you know, he goes on a final four run and now look at Brad Underwood, who I know we'll talk about plenty, but Brad Underwood's hugely successful, a K state guy and K-State fans see him and there, you know, there's just that envy, like that could be our guy. That's our program builder. He's one of us. So he did have some unfortunate circumstances when it comes to, you know, Frank goes to the final four right after Bruce loses in the first round of the tournament. And then, you know, Brad Underwood's having a ton of success these last two years while Bruce Weber's flailing. And again, to, 
I, I don't look, I mean, I'm pretty neutral on, on Bruce Weber at this point in time. I feel like just very level headed, very much appreciate what he did realize that I was an a-hole in the beginning uh, to him and took way too long to come around on that. Realized that I should have appreciated some of that stuff more. Um, but in the end, man, I'll defend Bruce a little bit on this and say, you're right, Cole. He was facing the fact that John Curry was the real villain and Bruce became the easy vessel to like take a lot of the, the vitriol from everybody. But also he was the he was like the total antithesis of Frank Martin, right? Like he's not an engaging personality. He's not a brand. He's the complete opposite of that. While still a pretty good basketball coach, he was never going to be that. And so when you're the total contrast of that, the, the previous figure was beloved. You're just going to be up against it. And then, yes, like you mentioned, Brad Underwood. I mean, heck, there's even Lon Kruger and Bob Huggins out there in the Big 12 every year that K-State fans look and say, like, these guys coached us up. And Lon Kruger went to a Final Four. Like, Bob Huggins had been to a Final Four since he left K-State. So there was just a lot of, like, window shopping going on from K-State fans. And if you're Bruce, you're looking at it and saying, man, I went through the same thing pretty much in Illinois, too, where it's like I had Bill Self. And I was never good at, as good as Bill Self. I could never live up to that. I could never be that guy. And he's killing it at Kansas. Then I have to go play him and get my brains beat in by him every single year when I come to K-State. Like, there are a lot of circumstances here that are fairly unique that worked against Bruce and that would really, I think, just dig at anybody, like any human being. And, and you could say, hey, you got to be stoic and block all that out. And I think it is probably true if you're at that level. But Bruce, after a while, like, look, man, if it's if I'm just going out like it's it's the end of it, I'm going to air some of that out because I did I had to deal with if I'm Bruce a lot of a lot of stuff that I couldn't control that really hurt how people perceive. Me. John, you're going to grow your hair until Kansas is punished. Uh, I will not be doing that. Bruce Weber, of course, did say the press conference that he is going to uh, to grow. Well, he was planning on growing his hair out until. <laughs> He mentioned the FBI scandal. And look, Kansas fans, I heard you in everybody's mentions. I mean, good Lord, you guys were triggered by that comment. <laughs> uh, I understand the FBI theoretically in the lawsuit was saying that Kansas was a victim here. But we know, like, look, we've seen the text in court, like the Curtis Townsend text. We, we know what was going on there, Kansas. All right. And, you know, hopefully your comeuppance is coming here. Although the good old scoopmeister, Mike Vernon, his report has not come to fruition yet. He was wrong again. Shocker. Um, but Kansas fans, we understand that you're a little triggered by Bruce's comment there. That's one that, again, I, I Cole, I'm with you. That's probably a little cringy. But, but if you are, but that just isn't some insight into this where like Bill Self has been that guy. Since Bruce did the fake funeral thing and wasn't Bill Self when he came into Illinois, he almost won the national championship and yet still was hated by Illinois fans at the end of that. And Bill Self has been at the the master controls for that. They've lost recruits. Jethro Muscadden, uh, what, was Mario Little? I can't remember if that – maybe that was Frank. But they've lost recruits to Kansas over the years. Christian Brown, right, is a guy that they probably would have really liked. You can see how at the end of this, Bruce would just be like, man, i got to take a little dig at Kansas. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't blame them. I will say this, for Kansas thinking that they're above fault in the whole FBI scandal, they, they sure thought that that comment was pointed directly at them, which it was, but I think it shows their guilt that they knew it was about them. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, if, a whole different topic. If I'm a Kansas fan, I would just embrace it. Like, yeah, we cheated like everybody else. It's worked really well. We win basketball games. Like, okay, that's, that's how it is. Bruce has always felt that, you know, when he got hired, I had a one-on-one -on -one interview with him right after he got hired and we, we sat there for about an hour and he talked about the frustration, you know, they had Eric Gordon taken from them. Indiana came in and got Eric Gordon out of Chicago and, and Bruce thought some sketchy things happened with that recruitment. He brought up Sharon Collins, Bill Self, KU, you know, some of our conversation was on background only, but he clearly had some feelings toward what Bill Self and some of these coaches were doing. And Bruce, to be fair, you know, and in recognition of him, always did do things the right way. And so you can appreciate that about him. He, he did not cut corners and try to cheat while some of these other coaches have and have gotten away with it. And I could see why that would be very frustrating to him. It's frustrating to me as a Kansas State fan to watch programs get away with cheating four or five years ago and see nothing happen yet. You know, you got Will Wade of LSU being recorded making a strong ass offer to a recruit and Will Wade's coaching. I, I, every time I turn on an LSU game, I'm like, how is he still getting four and five star recruits? How is he still the coach? Well, when is this? So I understand Bruce's perspective. That would be very frustrating 
to continue to play by the rules while others didn't. That's his brand at this point. Yeah, I mean, and, and he mentioned being on the, what, the rules committee or whatever it is, the ethics committee uh, for the NCAA. Like, it, it is something that is deeply meaningful to, to Bruce. And, um, you know, he went into some of his backstory at the, the Big 12 tournament, too. He, he is a great story. Coming from adversity, he mentioned his father didn't even have a high school degree, and Bruce had this great story about driving nine hours to go meet up with Gene Cady to be a uh, – a GA with him at Western Kentucky and he didn't even show up to the interview and had to kind of talk his way into a job. Like Bruce, there are a lot of things that I think a lot of traits that are very admirable about Bruce because of the circumstances, because of how he handled himself publicly, like people never came around to totally appreciate it. And that's where like, before I move on to Brad and what K-State's going to go do from here. I mean, I think the legacy question is very interesting here on Bruce because I, I do think, look, and I, I, there was one person that I do respect that I was going back and forth with about, what is the future of K-State basketball going to be? And what is the risk of, you know, you make a move here and you get the next hire wrong and you're back to being kind of like that Woldridge Asbury program of the late 90s, early 2000s. I mean, there is certainly some risk there. There absolutely is. But at the same time, he went through a stretch the last three years that was worse than anything Asbury or Woldridge did. So, like, you, you have to make a move. And I this is not the same as some of the previous downturns that Bruce had in the program. However... I do think there will, might come a day where five years down the road, if K-State does screw up the hire, we'd be looking back like, man, even like that 13-14 Marcus Foster team that made the NCAA tournament, like that, that was actually a pretty fun season. He's dunking all over John Stockton's kid and beating Gonzaga in Wichita. Like, you know, there were still some fun moments that happened even outside of the real high highs. But you may be watching, you know, your YouTube highlights of K-State beating Kentucky in a regional semifinal and being like, damn, man, that was fun. Like, it would be nice to be back there. I, I do think there's a chance that, like, the legacy of Bruce takes on a different sort of life with most of the fans, especially now that it feels like most fans are, are more, like, down where I'm at, like, kind of dead center on this thing. The majority of people being able to appreciate some of it, look back and realize the guy got treated pretty poorly most of the time, well acknowledging the faults, too. So the legacy, it's just, it's one of the most complex legacies I can think of certainly in K-State sports, but like in sports in general, because I've always said it's like an inkblot test. If you ask one person what they think of Bruce Weber, they can see something completely, completely different than the next guy. And that's always been the case. And I still feel like at the end of the day, at the end of his career, it is such a hard thing to reconcile. Like three near last place finishes in the Big 12, last place or near last place finishes in the Big 12, but two Big 12 championships, snapping Kansas a streak and an Elite Eight, all things that had not been accomplished basically since the seventies at K state. Like it's, it's just such a hard thing to reconcile here at the end of the day. He was one of the best coaches they'd had in three decades and one of the worst coaches they've had in, you know, a lot of, a lot of time too. He was the both the best and the worst at the same time in many cases. That's, that's how I would kind of describe it, I guess. And, and to me, I think his legacy will probably remain a polarizing one because I don't know that anyone's personal feelings are really going to subside or be modified much differently than what they are now. But I think the anger and the vitriol will probably be lesser just with time, just as anything. When you know you let time kind of grow from a fight, and and then you're you're less mad later. I think that's what's going to happen with Bruce Weber. But I will say at the end of the day when – and I know we talked to Carrington about this, John, but uh, at the end of the day when he comes back to Bramlage at some point and he, there's teams honored, like reunions of some sort, he's not going to get booed by any means. And there will be ovations for him, I'm sure, probably stronger than there would be right now. But I think his players will be the ones that receive the much louder ovations than he will, which is probably much different in the Kansas State Athletics – uh, you know, ecosphere environment than say Bill Steiner or Frank Martin, that would be reversed. If Frank comes back with his team, so, some players are going to get loud ovations, but Frank's probably going to get the loudest one. Bill Snyder is probably going to get the loudest one. For Bruce, it's probably going to be flipped. His players are going to get the loudest ovations. Yeah, the anger is going to subside. I mean, I, I think as everyone takes a step back, uh, everyone will have cooler heads will prevail with all of this. And it, it's not it's not like the Wolder Jazzberry era and that John and I growing up as kids watching K-State basketball didn't know what success looked like. Uh, you know, it was year after year of losing. Never really knew when K-State was going to make the NCAA tournament or beat KU in my lifetime. And 
you know, that was a decade plus of failure. And now Kansas State has had a lot of success over the last 13 years. Credit to Huggins, Frank Martin, and Bruce Weber and building this program back up and letting K-State fans know we can be successful in basketball and letting people like us experience what an energized fan base, what Bramlage Coliseum can truly be when this program is rocking. And so, you know, they, they built it up. They've made it an attractive job. You know, those coaches, Bruce Weber too, they've shown that you can be successful here. You can contend with Kansas. You can win the Big 12. And so that's a credit to them. And because of that, I think a lot of coaches would love to coach at Kansas State. And I think Kansas State will have a lot of strong pool of candidates to replace Bruce Weber as a result. Well, that leads us obviously into where K-State is going here. And I, I, look, number one on everybody's list is and should absolutely be Brad Underwood. Um, beyond that, I think Grant McCaslin's a nice number two. If you're not able to get Brad Underwood, he's the, the head coach at, at North Texas right now. Um, but I, I think Brad deserves his own specific piece of this discussion, even as many would look at that and say, okay, John, <laughs> level with me here. Why is the coach who has won back-to-back Big Ten championships at Illinois a better – look, just a better program um, simply because of the fact that it's in Chicago's backyard and you have so much talent right around there. Um, why is a guy at a better program who's got it rolling going to come take somewhat of a rebuild job and a slight step down in prestige of the job and perhaps pay as well? And it's because we, we know, like, we have insight that – but Brad Underwood, who's from McPherson, Kansas, played for Jack Hartman at K-State, coached at K-State under Frank Martin. It's been his dream to be the head coach at K-State. He's also pushing 60 now. So this is it. Like, it is time to pee or get off the pot if you're going to be the head coach at, at K-State. So I think that is why we feel like there is actually a chance that this could happen. There is a hefty buyout that would be in the neighborhood of $8 million for Brad Underwood that K-State is going to need to take care of. But look, I guess I'll, you guys are the ones with more info on this than I. I'll leave it to you um, to decipher how much you want to put out there and how realistic you actually think Brad Underwood is. But I liked, Derek, how you put it earlier, I think when we were on 610, that was like it's within the realm of possibility. I don't know that anybody here is saying like it's the most likely outcome, but it, it certainly feels like something that right now is within the realm of possibility that case they could go get Brad Underwood. I don't think it's the most likely outcome, and I'm not sure that Cole would disagree with me on that, but it's not impossible. And it's probably, you know, it's maybe closer to a roll of the dice than it is impossible, which isn't saying much, obviously. But, you know, you take your odds with a coach that good. And the, the, because if you're Kansas State, this is only, this is the only scenario where a candidate with the prowess and the history and the success and the reputation of Brad Underwood probably becomes available to you. Do you think they're going to take a sitting Illinois coach that's won the Big Ten multiple years in a row? Otherwise, probably not. So this is this is the time you have to strike if you're Kansas State. And I and I think from what I've been able to obtain, I, I think that they realize that. Um, I think there's enough motivation from those that would be providing the money that they can make a – you know, some kind of stab at Brent Underwood and feel good about what they've proposed. Um, does that mean he's going to take that ball that they give him and run it across the finish line or across the goal line? It doesn't, but if you're Kansas State, you gotta you gotta throw that throw that pass and, and see what see what happens. And I think they're going to do that. I think they've been in the process of doing that. Um, and we're probably still a ways away from knowing what if Brad Underwood's going to catch that and just you know run with it. But I will say that I think we're going to get to a point, we might already be there, where they've done enough themselves, Kansas State, I mean, that it's probably going to be at some point in Brad Underwood's court whether or not he wants to take probably this last opportunity to go home and be the head coach at his alma mater. So it, it's been a long time, I'll just attest, since I've spoken to Brad Underwood directly. I mean, it's back when he was leaving Kansas State. It was the last time I actually spoke to him directly. But I can tell you that I covered the team, obviously, during the entire Frank Martin era and Brad Underwood while he was here. And I feel like I had a pretty good relationship with Brad. We talked a lot. And I, I did a story one time about how they were rebuilt the program and just turned it around. And I spoke to Brad at length, you know, being a former player, coming back, 
you know, watching the fans fill the stands again, be unified and re-energized in Bramlage. I wanted to do a lengthy piece on that. So we did a thorough deep dive. I spoke to Brad at length and Brad got choked up multiple times talking about how they turned this program around and how much it meant to him. I truly believe that Kansas State is Brad Underwood's dream job just from conversations I've had with him. And again, things could have changed. It's been 10 years. But I feel very strongly that if Kansas State can come up with the resources and the money to buy Brad Underwood out and give him a competitive salary, a competitive coaching assistant salary, a competitive pool of money for his assistant coaches, that Brad Underwood would take the job and come home to Kansas State. And, you know, look, Illinois is going to fight tooth and nail to keep Brad Underwood. They're tasting success for the first time in a while, consistent success with him. They'll offer probably $5 million plus a year. But to me, it doesn't necessarily come down to money for Brad. I mean, I think give him, you know, I, I don't know, close to $4 million, I think there's a good chance he takes that. Uh, that's a lot for K-State. But if they can drum up the donor support to make this work, I think he would be the next head coach at K-State. And he, he's just what they need. And from a revenue perspective, I know basketball is not football in terms of producing dollars, but it's going to completely revitalize the fan base. Season ticket sales will sell out and you'll have Pac Bramlage again, just like when Huggins took over. And so you're going to be looking at a couple million dollars, probably more a year, getting people back in the seats, season ticket sales, donations to help make up a little bit of the sting of what you're going to probably have to pay him and that buyout, hopefully. So, uh, I think it's it's a tremendous fit. He's exactly what they need. Gene Taylor could have a statue built for all I care. He can get Brad Underwood and build a, build a statue of Gene Taylor because th that would be a dream come true. I would still describe it as something where they kind of have to thread the needle. And, and I do think, look, to be honest, because we know how a lot of this stuff works, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, in terms of a buyout that's usually mostly generated that that – the money, the dollar figures, they're mostly generated by donors in terms of buyouts. And they have to buy out Bruce and they have to buy out Brad Underwood. And I think his buyout increased after it was $8 million a year ago. So the new extension kind of made it a little bit more complicated of an endeavor. But just because that is donor-centric, I would think not that it's easy. It's not my money. So I, I, I'm calling it like it's easy. It's not. But I would think that might be easier to account for than maybe a salary just because the salary is more out of the operating budget. Um, and Cole probably messes around with a lot of this stuff more than I do, so he could probably correct me if I'm wrong on that front. So I would think the biggest hurdle from a financial means might not even be the buyout. It might be more so the operating budget that you have to deal with in terms of Brad's salary and, and his assistant pool because he's going to have demands and he knows what it takes to be successful. He's been in Illinois. He's, he's used to a certain you know dollar figures to spread out and – and resources at its disposal, not just in recruiting base, but also resources to really build out a quality staff. And so there's a lot of fronts that Kansas State would have to answer the bell on. Um, and then Brad, at the end of the day, would you know have to decide that I'm ready to leave what I've built here. And let's be honest, he's built something really well there that they haven't had. Guess what? Ironically, since Bruce Weber was their coach. Yeah, well, it's a great point. Illinois absolutely is going to fight tooth and nail and do whatever they can because, yeah, I mean, that's a fan base that feels pretty tortured um, over the last 20 years. They went through the same ride that K-State fans went with Bruce Weber, where a lot of people felt very unsatisfied by the end, even though there were some high highs. You know, they go through, like, John Gross. I mean, there have just been some lean, lean years, and they finally, after some early struggles, by the way, with Brad, uh, they finally now have seemingly hit it pretty big with him and and have it absolutely rolling. So they are not about to let their coach walk to what they would, I'm sure, view as a, a lesser program without much of a fight. Um, I will just say, though, like I know it would be very easy to look at this conversation and just say this is a lot of wishful thinking from all these guys. You know, no one went too deep into it. But this I'll just say these conversations that we're, we're having, like we would not be having this Brad Underwood conversation this in-depth if it were just us saying, well, look, he's a grad. We hope he comes home. This would be awesome. There's more to it. All right. I mean, I'm not a big J journo anymore. Cole's not a big J journo anymore, but Derek is. And you know, we, we've got, a, we've got a little bit of that. I'm going to quote Jay Z for the second time today. <laughs> I am past the bar, but I know a little bit. Okay. 
it's not totally out of the realm of possibility here that this could happen. So that there is there is a reason that we are getting this in depth on the conversation right now. To add to that, and John and, and Cole, both of you can attest to this. Even though Bruce Weber didn't retire, resign, or get fired after last year, the same Brad Underwood chatter was kind of present this time last year. There was talks about him, you know, at least peaking at Kansas State because we thought it, the job could come open at that time. And and obviously the rumor associated with that was maybe some distrust that was present between him and the athletic director at Illinois. If I thought there was no chance, I wouldn't have had my five-year-old parading around T-Mobile Center Wednesday night. <laughs> with a pay Brad sign. All right. I wouldn't, I would not have ran to the high V by my house, got poster board, made a sign for my five-year-old with a $5 bill on it to pay Brad. If I didn't think there was a chance. So let's just say that there's some credible information out there that would lead you believe that this could be done. Yes. I think that, that that's fair and we can leave it there. There is a, and, and I hate the fact that I say like, it is going to be a blow if it moves to the next phase of like who are the next candidates. But I can also say that like it feels fairly encouraging, I think, where it's at even beyond Brad. And that starts with McCasland at, at North Texas. Uh, I think he is he would have he would be at the top of my list before we got wind of some of this Brad stuff here. I mean, my realistic list that he seemed like the most exciting candidate that was out there. Not a ton of competition, like what Georgia, Mississippi State might be two of the jobs that you're you're competing with. Missouri, um, Missouri, in Missouri potentially. Um, you know, th these are these are going to be the competitors, but it's not a crazy year. It's not like this past college football coaching carousel where like every major job was open. Um, so I think there are some some candidates. I could certainly talk myself into probably at least two to three other candidates here that have come up pretty regularly. Yeah, Grant McCaslin's name is probably going to come up for every job that becomes available. That, like you said, Mississippi State, Georgia, Missouri, I imagine he's going to be a candidate there. You have to hope that his Big 12 pedigree, well, maybe, assuming like Brad Edwards off the table, of course, his Big 12 pedigree leans him towards the Big 12 because Kansas State's going to have interest in him. Like if Brad Underwood was like an impossibility, Grant McCaslin's probably my number one target. And to be honest, I think that might be the case for Kansas State, too, when it comes down to it. Maybe we'll find that out. Maybe we won't. But uh, he is a, an incredibly attractive candidate in my mind. I'm not sure that there's been a, you know, just no a no-doubter number one candidate among the mid-majors in terms of head coaches because usually there's like three or four. You're like, oh, I like Kim. Or, you know, you can kind of just, you know, pick one. They're all about the same. I think McCaslin's head and shoulders above everyone else. And the fact that he's worked for Scott Drew is attractive. The fact that he's had transfers is attractive that, that have had success. The fact that he's, you know, obviously because he's dealing with the disadvantage being in the mid-major, but he's had players plucked away, of course, and gone to high majors because they're good enough. One being Umoja Gibson going to Oklahoma and having success. If he has those kinds of guys in North Texas, then I feel pretty good about even if we don't know a whole lot about his recruiting pedigree, at least to find talent regardless of where he's from or what, what school he is coaching. He also, you know, as a starter at South Carolina, a starter at Gonzaga. So he's he's no stranger to acquiring talent, regardless of where it is. I mean, North Texas, let's, let's be honest, they were pretty pretty bad when he took it over. Arkansas State was even worse, and he was there for one year and turned them around in a flash. So there is a lot to like about Graham McCaslin. And really, the only bugaboo that anyone has about him is his pace. But because he plays a slower brand of basketball. But I can live with that just because he also plays efficient basketball, uses analytics. He, he, he invokes Ken Palm a lot. So he, his teams have all shot 37% from three or better the last three seasons. So he, if you're going to play that kind of basketball, then you better be efficient, and his teams are. I mean, before we knew about the Brad stuff over the last couple of weeks, McCaslin, I think we universally jumped on as – wanted him to be the number one guy, you know, at all of us text, obviously. Um, it, I, he's my top guy outside of Brad. I mean, you, you look at his resume, you look at what he's doing. I, I watched their game in the NCAA tournament against Purdue last year when they knocked off the Boilermakers. North Texas was a 13. Uh, it, it, I don't try to wait, put too much on those random upsets, right? But I was very impressed with the way they played. And what D.Y. mentioned, what really impresses me is that he has sustained the success 
despite losing one of his top two scorers to the transfer portal each of the last three years. I mean, Ryan Woldridge, his leading scorer, transferred to become the starting point guard at Gonzaga. And then a year later, he's in the NCAA tournament. North Texas, McCasland is. You know, he loses James Reese to South Carolina this year, second leading scorer off last year's team. And then Gibson, you mentioned that, D.Y. at OU. We saw what he did to K-State just the uh, last Saturday. So, you know, this is, to me, he, he's a guy that would be a great fit. Like you, I don't get wrapped up in pace. As long as you're efficient, pace is fine with me. You can play a slower pace if you're you're hitting a high percentage of your shots and playing good offense. So I'd love to get McCaslin. I like that he's been in the Big 12 for several years as well under a very good Big 12 staff and Scott Drew. Um, so I, I think he'd be a perfect fit for K-State if they can't get Underwood. And he took the defense away from uh, Mark Adams at Texas Tech, runs the same defense, and took it to Baylor. Scott Drew has it, and now he has it in North Texas. So not not a bad scheme to have in your back pocket. Uh, other any, any other names you guys want to throw out here before we wrap up? Yeah, nothing is really considerable as – really been presented at least on a on a considerable level. I, I would say Jerome Tang at Baylor has got some steam, but I just nothing really serious is really I get I think hit the service enough to really put a lot of oxygen into yet. And obviously we're also just, you know, what is it, a little over twelve hours or less than twelve hours since right. the Bruce Weber announcement has been made. So there's going to be some the valleys and ups and downs and of how this proceeds, but I, nobody that's really reached a considerable level that I think is worth discussing, at least at this point, at least in my mind. I, I like, I like the idea of Tang. The, the only concern I have with him is he just, he's been under Scott Drew's shadow for so long and hasn't left his side. It's kind of like the Sean Snyder argument with Bill, right? I mean, he just constantly stayed under him. He never became a head coach on his own. And, and that would be my concern there, but he, he's of interest to me. And definitely we've heard his name thrown around. You know, a guy that you know, I had some interest in, and I think K-State's at least had some discussions on him, but I don't think it's serious by any means, is Chris Mack, um, you know, fired from Louisville this season. I just think there's too many complicating factors there, um, you know, with the way that he was ousted and what transpired and the Dino Gaudio recording of his assistant. Uh, I, I don't think there's a realistic shot of that happening. I think they just they did discuss his name. He would be of interest to me. He did a great job at Xavier, but didn't fit at Louisville, really. So uh, that's the only other name, really, that I'd throw out. I, I, I don't have a great – you know, we hear Nico Nedved's name at Colorado State. I think he's okay, but I, I'd be concerned about his recruiting pedigree to recruit to K-State at a high enough level. So, you know, I, I don't think he'd be one of my top targets. I, I think the guys we outlined, Underwood, McCaslin, Tang, uh, would really be those top three. One thing I'll be curious about is if Eric Pastrana's name ever gets some steam at any point. I know he's, you know, still a little bit younger and, and all that, but a guy that GA'd for Frank Martin at K-State, coached under Brad Underwood at Stephen F. Austin, coached under Mike Boyd at Oklahoma State, now is at Florida under Mike White, even though there's talk about Mike White not having a job there in Gainesville for much longer. I'll just be curious if that one just, you know, starts to circulate – at a considerable level at any point. That'll that'll be interesting just because there's the obvious connections. There's one thing to take away, ladies and gentlemen. Big Brad energy. That is what we need from you. Okay, moving forward. Big Brad energy. Hey, Brad, whatever you got a hashtag, get it out there. Find the old pics of him in the K-State uniforms. Let's 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 get this thing happening. We gotta get Brad Underwood to K-State, man. I think, that, I think that's where we're all at, right? Like, I know me and Cole are. Maybe DY is a little more removed from it. I think me and Cole are going to be. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think we're still at the point where people need to temper their hopes and expectations a little bit, just to, just because I don't think we're further enough along to, to for the excitement to really be that palpable. I will be interested if the Illinois media decide to confront him with any questions regarding the job at the Big Ten tournament. Well, because it feels like. Illinois fans certainly that we're saying like do do not take this very seriously at all yeah. right now. So yes, I, I I'm very curious how the Illinois media thinks of this right now. Oh, we we saw it, John, on the uh, the picture you put out of Brody last night at the game. I mean, Illinois fans were making a mockery of it. They they just think it's laughable that Brad Underwood would come to Kansas State. I don't know if they understand the allure of home necessarily, but we've experienced it here at Kansas State with Bob Huggins when he left at the age of 54 and. He, he kind of looked at that as his last opportunity to go home. Brad Underwood's 58. 
this is, you know, home is where the heart is, Brad, come home. I will say one thing that you, you made me think, John, is uh, after Illinois got rid of Bruce Weber, I think they hired John Gross, and it really, really went downhill at that point. So let's let's not do that. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 God, no, no John Gross. Don't let that guy anywhere near uh, this program. <laughs> uh, all right. It's going to wrap it up. Obviously, a lot of emotions flying for everybody right now. It's uh, It's been a pretty crazy day, but uh, we appreciate uh, those of you who hung with us here for the little uh, the emergency pod with Bruce Weber out at K-State. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, at JL Kurtz. You can obviously follow uh, Cole Manbeck, the Young Rivals, uh, on Twitter as well if you want to follow these two. Uh, thanks to 360 Vodka and Holiday Distillery for everything they do to uh, support the pod. And uh, talk to you guys soon.